Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite weary. This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and 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 why that's so. Yali no chime, and welcome to Tales from Aztlantis. The show where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, New Age nonsense, and other stories of adventure. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa and Ruben Arellano, also known as Tlacateca. Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to yet another episode of Tales from Aztlantis. This is episode number 20, the final episode of season one. So, to everybody who's been listening this Far, I thank you for giving us a shot, and we hope you've enjoyed season one of Tales from Aztlantis. My co-host, Ruben Arellano Tlacateca, is busy. Today, it seems that school at the university is about to start back up in Texas, and he is busy trying to get all of his classes together, so he will not be joining us today. But I am joined by two guests, so this is, we're switching it up. We have two guests today. Two friends of mine, uh, who I hope you will enjoy. The topic today is bad Nahuatl, and what can we do about it? So joining us is Jan Garcia, the author of Learn Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs and modern Nahuas, which is now in its second edition. And I got to tell everybody out there, if you haven't gotten this book yet, you need to go out and get it. This is my go-to book for studying modern Nahuatl of the um, the Huasteca variety. And I really recommend that you get this. So thank you for joining us, Jan Garcia. Also joining us today is Dr. Magnus Hansen. Magnus is an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen and a professional linguist specializing in the Nahuatl language. So gentlemen, thank you both for coming on the show. Ascomati for having us. Ascomati. Thanks. Yeah, of course. So today we're going to be talking about bad Nahuatl. And this is something that I see a lot because, you know, coming out of the Mexicayo, I was introduced to a lot of really bad Nahuatl from a, from a, a, a young age uh, in my teens and, you know, I didn't know any better, right? So I had these people that they looked, they presented themselves as native speakers of Nahuatl. And I didn't know. They sounded legit. They looked legit. I was going to these ceremonies. and But later in life, I started realizing that the stuff that I was learning was um, not really grounded in any sort of linguistic reality. And then now with uh, the advent of social media... We get all of these memes and videos that are passed around online. And, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming people for sharing these things because they probably don't know any better. They have good intentions. They want to share the language. They want to, they're proud of the language. They want to pass it on to others. But the problem with a lot of these memes and videos is that it's not 
grammatically correct Nahuatl or it's Nahuatl that, you know, doesn't mean what they think it means or it's Nahuatl that was completely made up. And you see a lot of that um, coming from the uh, the MCRCA and early Mexicayot organizations. So, Jan, you had made a video recently where you tackled this subject. What was the, um, how's the response been to that video? I think it's been pretty good. Uh, a lot of people said and commented on that, that they were looking for something like that for some time now. And, you know, I, I get messages all the time from people who say, finally, you know, I see now that's actually spoken and it's not just, you know, chants or songs, which are great. But oftentimes in early times in, in you know, the social media, that was all that was available when it came to Nahuatl. And little by little, you're starting to see more of the actual Nahuatl and how it's spoken. Um, just a few people who, of course, you know, you're going to have cognitive dissonance when you've been you've grown into this and you've been using these words all your life. And for someone to tell you that, hey, by the way, you know, native Nahuatl speakers don't use it or it doesn't mean that or it doesn't mean what you think it means or it's not actually a word. Uh, it's not going to be easy for everyone to respond to that. And so oftentimes not everyone's going to comment that and, you know, and talk about how they feel in that sense. But, uh, you know, a, f- a few people, uh, a few people might will will do that. So was there any word in particular that people pointed out like, man, that that one tripped me up. I didn't, I, I had no idea that that word was incorrect. I think it was just the, the general, everything in general. I, no one said specifically, this is the one mm-hmm. thing that, that I got, but there's just so many examples. There's just so much stuff that's constantly out there. Um, one of the things that you might notice is that it, it almost feels like, you, you know, we're working against the giant wave that's pushing against us uh, because, you know, the, the stuff that's not real and has been around so long it's just so easy to just put out there into a meme um, and given the right aesthetics or whatever, it'll be compounded and multiplied. And that's what people will end up seeing, the, the stuff that's easy to mis- make mistakes on, easy to repeat. The, it's almost like the more fake something is, the more likely it's, it is to be out there. Um, so we certainly yeah, have a, right. a lot of work yeah. ahead, ahead of us for, you know, what we're trying to do is promote the language, revitalize it. Um, you know, encourage people to to speak it again if it was part of your heritage, part of your ancestry, or if you're a lost diaspora native uh, from Mexico or Mexican ties, you know, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to regain this language and, and, and bring it back. But and it's unfortunate, the, the first people who started with trying to promote the language, maybe in the 70s and 60s or even before that, uh, you know, they had a shaky foundation and everything's been built on top of that foundation. And, you know, as much as possible, it's it's best to cor- make these corrections as, as hard as it is for some of us to accept sometimes. But, um, you know, when you when you start having the future generations, you know, think of uh, someone, a child who might be na- given a, a name by birth. Um, and in the future, maybe they'll fi- find out that it's not you know legitimate name. Well, how's that going to be good for the movement? How's that going to be good for encouraging the child to continue down this path? You know, thinking about our future generations. Um, but there's just there's there's a whole bunch of categories I can get into in, in a bit. But there's different categories of of uh, of these words. There's different patterns I've noticed in, in how you can categorize these mistakes. So, Magnus, in in your work, um, and I know that you do a lot of um, research regarding uh, Chicanos re-identifying, uh, reconnecting with their indigeneity and, and trying to learn Nahuatl, are there um, words that you've come across that are, are glaring examples that Chicanos seem to get wrong a lot? Because I, I, I know I've gotten quite a lot wrong in my efforts to, uh, to learn Nahuatl. Well, I think I'd like to start by saying that, that really I think that all Nahuatl is good Nahuatl and any Nahuatl is good Nahuatl. So um, I don't want to... I don't want to be a judge of what is and isn't uh, good now. Good man. Um, I think the thing is, it it it's good that it's being spoken, right? But what is sometimes bad are claims about now that end up being false, right? So when when people take on an authority to say that, that this is the right way or this is the true way or this is the way it's supposed to be or this is the true origin of something and when it's it's 
uh, maybe not. I think those to me are the more, more problematic things, how people pronounce words or if they give them new meanings, I think, well, go ahead, do that. Uh, as long as you don't go and tell other people that they have to use it in that same way, right? Um, though to me, some of those claims that sometimes come, come, come out of the, the, the Mexicai movement is uh, more problematic to me when they start telling, for example, even sometimes uh, uh, now speakers from Mexico who grow up speaking the language that they're, they're doing it wrong, mm -hmm. right? I think that is, that, is the, that is the real heavy problem because it's actually a hindrance for making the language um, stronger. Mm -hmm. because you you don't make it stronger by going around pointing fingers at people and saying that they don't speak it right yeah to to native speakers um so, so to me those those are the things that i've i reacted more strongly to when i've found those claims right and that could be uh well one of the things that i've always uh sort of railed against is that the idea that uh um now documented in the colonial sources is the real Nahuatl and the, the, what is spoken in Mexico now is sort of the, uh, uh, a degenerate debased version of that, which is uh, both untrue and also uh, <laughs> a very... <laughs> um, well, it's insulting, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very colonialist idea to take. Yeah, it is. Um, so, so those things are, are what it mostly... Uh, been annoyed at but then sometimes you also get certain things that uh, sort of seep into the way that that the language is used so for example uh historians um will often because they they read now what from books but they don't hear it spoken so they'll have them like very uh very um um some pronunciations that are very close to the letters as you would read them in in English or Spanish, but not the way that they're supposed to be pronounced in, in Nahuatl. So you get a very common pronunciation, for example, of the word for Lord, um, which is written, of course, T-E-C-U-H in the, the in one of the common orthographies. And many historians and, and other, other people will also um, pronounce that as Tecutli or something like that. But really, um, since there's no you vowel in in uh, colonial now uh, that you represents just lip rounding on the k so it's usually it would be pronounced as something like tectly but pro probably more likely as tectly um that's how i've heard that word um, uh, pronounced pronounced by by native speakers for example so that that pronunciation can get a little bit um uh the heavy <laughs> it has a whole extra syllable right a, a whole extra syllable uh and a vowel that doesn't exist in 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 the language um and then you will get people uh, uh, like even correcting other pronunciations so it's it's the cootly or whatever mm -hmm. and that gets well if you look at like the word um uh motexoma right yeah. or montezuma yeah. Or moteku so there's like I've seen at least three or four different ways of writing. Yeah, that's a that's a famously <laughs> problematic word, right? Because because Montezuma with that M that comes in from nowhere became very widespread very early. Um, and then Moctezuma, uh, moteku soma. Yeah, and then you have the one with the K switched in front mm -hmm. of it. And yeah, yeah. So of course, so some of those. So some of those go back like way to the to, to the actual uh, moment of of colonization when Spaniards just didn't uh, know how to pronounce things. So you get the Guatemus for Guatemoc and Montezuma uh, and all those uh, those weird uh, names and Temestitan for Tenochtitlan mm -hmm. and all those. Well, I've words. I've noticed that one mistake a lot of people make when they're making claims about Nahuatl. And I see this a lot, um, in particular from people who've come from the Mexicayot. So when I first got involved in Mexicayot, one of the first things that I heard or that I was taught was that Nahuatl was outlawed by the Spaniards, right? That 
our ancestors were punished for for speaking Nahuatl, that that the speakers were, you know, you would have your tongue cut out. I, I heard that claim made that they would cut your tongue out if they caught you speaking Nahuatl or singing Nahuatl songs. And this just, I mean, it's factually incorrect to make that assertion, right? Like that's simply not true. They did not outlaw the speaking of Nahuatl. In fact, the Spaniards needed that language because they were using it as a tool of conversion. They were using it as a way to communicate with other indigenous peoples. Even if the other indigenous peoples weren't Nahuatl speakers, they would rely on people who spoke Nahuatl and another language to act as interpreters. So the idea that Nahuatl was outlawed is just, is just not true. Do you want to um, expand on that? No, in, in fact, yeah. So, so in fact, uh, as you say, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, the, it, it has never been outlawed um, as such. And especially not in the, in the colonial period, because in 1570, Felipe II even uh, decreed that the use of, of Nahuatl should be the official language of New Spain. Um, so it, it was actually made an official language in, in the period. Then later on, it was made unofficial again, but it, it was still used in a lot of official capacity. So it definitely wasn't um, outlawed in this period. Of course, what we maybe are um, um, mixing up a little bit is, of course, we know that they've earned a lot of books in uh, uh, indigenous books, right? And we may have the idea that these books were written in Nahuatl and that they were burning them because of the language. Um, but, uh, but these were, of course, uh, mostly pictorial codices that didn't in directly encode uh, the Nahuatl language. And they were burned uh, because of the pictures because they were considered to be idolatrous pictures not because uh, they had a connection to the language. Well, there's that one famous image of the priests burning the, the codices, and you could see uh, spirits, right, coming out of the burning books. So there was a reason, the reason they were burning those books, they were religious reasons, not not because of the Nahuatl language. So I think that's an important point. To what, what, is, what is slightly, what, where, where it comes to be a little bit more correct, is if you think about Nahuatl uh, now, of course, um, thousands and thousands of Nahuatl speakers have grown up being punished for speaking Nahuatl in school. Um, so it, from the 40s and 50s on, maybe even earlier, um, since the establishment of, of the school system in, in Mexico, school teachers have punished children who spoke Nahuatl and discouraged them from speaking. And that is, that is absolutely true, but that's, that's the last 100 years more or less. Um, and, and that I think is probably the main reason that Nahuatl has, has been become a, a declining uh, uh, language in the way that it has. Um, so, so this part of it is true, but it's not true that it was so in, in, in the uh, colonial period because in the colonial period, um, indigenous people in Mexico were organized into these, um, what they called Repúblicas de Indios, which were basically self-governing little republics uh, that would uh, have a lot of freedom to organize themselves um, and speak their own language. They could even have scribal schools where they taught how to write their own language. Uh, only as long as they communicated with the Spanish colonial administration in in Spanish, you should right? Um, but within the Republic itself, um, the, the indigenous languages were always um, al allowed. Yeah, and, some, and sometimes people conflate that with the, with, with, with the experiences of the Sioux people in the Lakota and, and people in the North, where you know, there was a lot of banishing of the languages, but also again, in the school system, when there was a policy of, you know, whitewashing everyone and assimilation basically. Um, and so that goes in hand with the same experiences in the schools in Mexico, except in Mexico, it wasn't through the Catholic church most of the time, but through government sponsored, uh, government run schools that again, had the policy of trying to assimilate everyone and to speak Spanish. So that it, I see conflation there happening too. Yeah, I, th I think both, so, so both in, in the US and Mexico, this is a 20th century phenomenon. Um, 
this this idea of, of assimilating uh, the indigenous populations uh, by force and by taking away all their ties to to, to culture in 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 all of those horrific ways that that, uh, that this has been done from from boarding schools, which were also uh, used, although not a lot, in in Mexico, um, um, and and um, just general uh, discouragement and, and prohibition of using the language in, in official uh, capacities. But this is a 20th, 20th century phenomenon, mostly. Jan, you had mentioned that you had made a, a list of some of the common misconceptions or mistakes people are making when they're approaching the Nahuatl language. Um, the first thing that I see, just to start us right off, is the, the mispronunciation of the TL, right? So you'll hear Nahuatl, Quetzalcoatl, um, you know, they, they make it rhyme with bottle, like axolotl. Um, and it what it does is it creates two sounds instead of one, right? That the TL should be one sound. So do you want to, um, and the way I tell people to do it is if they, they put the, their tongue to the roof of their mouth and breathe out the sides, that's probably kind of close, right? Nawak, Nawak. Yeah. Yeah. I can coach most people to get to it, you know, when I'm working with people in person and, you know, so I know a lot of techniques about, you know, how to look at what people are doing with their mouths to try to get them to help them do it. Other people who struggle will just get it after practicing with us for some months and it'll just click at one point. So almost everyone who I've worked with will get it at one point. Um, and like Magna said, there's many correct pronunciations and many correct Nahuas. So it, when people can't say the TL, we say, you know, it's also acceptable just to say T, you know, Tlacat or Takat. There are varieties that say that. Even within the Huasteca, there's a couple of towns that say that. So it's not wrong to have to say the TL. Um, in Michoacan, you have the West Coast varieties that say L instead of that. So lakash. And it's a different kind of L still. It's kind of like the Navajo lakash, that you'll get. That kind of sounds like a T in a sense, but it's just that L with the air coming out of it. Um, but yeah, we coach people to get through that sound, get the TL. And, and it, it is kind of like a T, the plosive sound happening at the same time that you're having that kind of L sound together. That L sound, your tongue is in the position of an L. Ooh, but you're not voicing it like an L with your throat. Instead, the air is coming out the sides of your tongue. So it's like, pretend you're making an H sound while your tongue is making an L sound. And that will help you get that L sound. It's kind of like a slushy L that we say with kids when we work with kids. Um, it's kind of like that lisp, that's a, the lateral lisp that we some kids have in school, the sh sound. Except, so so there's that thing we, we, we help them out. Um, but that one, at least, you know, that's a pronunciation thing that people get after some time. In English, I get it. You know, when people say axolotl because they're speaking English, not speaking Nahuatl. You know, you're speaking a different language. That's why I call it the Klamath River instead of the Tlamath, Tlamath River that had the TL sound originally. But the Anglos couldn't do it. They heard it as a K. So when people are trying it, sometimes they'll, they'll pronounce it like a K sound. So people might say Tlakak or Siwak, like a K sound. When they're starting, starting to learn it. So we just say, just, just do a T sound or or we'll coach through the TL sound. But when it comes to pronunciation, what does come up often, and you'll see in the spelling, and this kind of a, uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a little bit of the blame here in the Spanish language. It's no fault of its own, but the Spanish language usually only has the ch, the ch sound. It doesn't have the sh sound anymore today, the ch sound, unless you're in, you know, in the northern parts of Mexico. You know, of course, there's, there's going to be exceptions but so we get confusion between when is it in and when is it the ch sound so you hear a lot of the the elder like you know the chicano elders you could say that they'll come you'll they'll say uh you know mexica for mexica right um though that's that's how you'll hear a lot of the older people say it and i think a lot of the younger people even in mexico in the city are, are getting better at making the sh sound when they're saying mexica or mexica but there was a lot of confusion and that leads to crew Confusions between the word chocolate, like chocolate, which Magnus has a great article on why it's chocolate or chocolate in some varieties. Um, but again, because people think, oh, now it has an X everywhere. So people will have a tendency to put that everywhere. So instead of recognizing that the word was spelled chocolate and chocolate in a lot of varieties, it's like, oh, it, had, it must be with an X because everything in now has an X. It looks cooler. Right, the, X, the X makes it real. <laughs> 
Kena, kena. Um, and people, when they're saying the word xochitl, the flower, right? If you speak Spanish, then, you, you know, my sister's name is Sochi, you know, and that's how we pronounce it because that makes sense in Spanish. But if, of course, if you're going to speak it in Nahuatl, then you want to try and make the native pronunciation. It's sho and chit. And beginners will have difficulty with that because we want to assimilate those two sounds. We want to say shoshit or chochit, one or the mm-hmm. other. We want to carry, make everything an X or make everything a CH. And that's when it gets tricky where we have to keep in mind in our head one, the within the same word, there's two different sounds, sho and then chit. And uh, I'll see mispronunciations for chili, which people say is chili. It's spelled with an X, but chili is a kind of crayfish in a lot of modern varieties, not chile. So, right? so you have chili and chili. Those are different sounds. Uh, misspellings of chicome with chicome. And I don't, I don't, almost no variety will say chicome for chicome. So that's the, that's the categorization I see of, of pronunciation errors in, in that well, one. Well, one thing I, I tell people is that xochit is actually a really good word to master because you get the sh sound, you get the ch sound, and you get the TL at the end, right? So if you could say xochit, that gives you kind of a, a good framework of how the language works and the sounds that, the way you're supposed to move your mouth when you're saying the, the sounds. Definitely has all the tricky parts into it. <laughs> all in one. That and, uh, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, you do have to train yourself to uh, memorize long patterns of sounds. Long yeah, sequences. Yeah, for sure. So another thing we might we might talk about is that, like the, the agglutination part, because it also does sometimes uh, lead people astray. So you get people to think that, oh, because now at least an agglutinating language, so that means you can just stick anything together in any order you like, and then you have a new word. And that's not exactly how it works, right? Because it has some very strict rules for how to stick things together. Because if you don't have uh, strict rules for how you do that, then you can't uh, interpret new words. So a, a now speaker wouldn't be able to understand a new word without having understood also the rule for how it's strung together those different parts. And it works both ways. So sometimes it's very uh, enticing for people when we try to understand a word to try to, to cut it up into bits that we can uh, understand. So you get, for example, the, the name of the deity, uh, Tlaloc, and you'll get people saying, oh, okay, so Tlal, that's, that's earth. And Ok, oh, that sounds like the word for pulque. So it must be, it must originally mean earth pulque or and then you can invent sort of a way for how earth pulque makes sense um, if you want, right? But, but really, just because uh, you can cut something into pieces doesn't mean that it's actually made of those pieces, right? Um, so many now words are very long, and you can segment them in different ways. Um, so uh, if you don't respect the rules of, of the grammar that, that, that uh, was used to make the word, so you can segment it in different ways. Uh, if if you want to and make up fanciful new etymologies for words yeah well um this one uh linguist was very kind when i was you know when i was young and i was like yeah well tlaloc that means licor de la tierra right like you know tlali and octli and he just looked at me and he's like well <laughs> I, I would consider that more of like a folk etymology. That's what he called it, a, a folk etymology, you know, and he wasn't judging, but he was like, nobody really knows what Tlaloc means. There's some hypotheses about the word means, but he wasn't able to tell me. He he told me he um, he, he believed it meant um, something that lays on the earth, maybe like because um, it's the rain, right? Tlaloc is the rain. Yeah, that's another way to, to cut up that word, um, and, and it and it's absolutely possible. I think it, it's certain, it probably more possible or uh, plausible than than the pulque uh, etymology. But really, yeah, they could they could be correct, uh, but only one of them would be uh, correct, though I guess. Um, but also, it could be a complete just a, a complete word, um, a name. These deity names are very old, and and they can have been carried over from a different stage of the language where it, it didn't, it could, it, 
that didn't come from either of those roots that you can cut it into now. Yeah, it's some, sometimes it's just a word, right, in itself without any deeper meaning. And this tends to happen easily in Nahuatl because, um, one, those long words that agglutinate, like Magna said, and the other thing that goes with that is that Nahuatl has less consonants than English does. It's got like 16 consonants. English has like 25. Nahuatl has like four vowels. English has like over 10. And so it's very easy to make these assumptions where you see these pieces and words and think it must break apart into that. Just because you recognize that word as a beginner without understanding how the word works together, without understanding the rules that go into play for all these things. So... Um, you know, having more contents, by the way, doesn't make a language better or worse in case anyone gets that interpretation. It's just, you know, the tools a language chooses to use um, or it just happens to come across. Um, but, you know, you can have like Tlaso Kamati and you'll see this very commonly where people will think, oh, Tlaso sounds like Tlasotla. And it, there is a connection in there. But then they see the Kama and they see, oh, well, Kama means mouth. And then they see the Mati and they know Mati means to know. So it means, so people will think, oh, so it must mean to know someone's love through your mouth or something like that. You you can piece this together in a billion different ways, you know, or to love that someone's sounds, mouth. <laughs> that sounds really dirty, by the way. <laughs> it can. So it's just the way people make these interpretations. And, you know, obviously that word wouldn't even be that. It would be tlasokama mati, first of all. So it wouldn't even be the right word. And the other thing is you can't just stick those two things together. So you have to have a, a good understanding of the language from the base of how things are put together and, and expand once you get to higher levels, because it's going to be put together in ways that are very different from English or Spanish. It's not just put things together and there you go. It's not just Lego pieces. But what are you going to do? Are you going to take a class in Nahuatl and, you know, hope you have a good teacher that explains these things to you at a beginning of levels where you dedicate all this time to it? Or am I going to go with the meme I just saw and, on Instagram or something that that broke it down. It's a yeah. lot easier to go. <laughs> it's a lot easier. And it sounds authoritative. So how would you break down? How would you break down the word la socamati? So the uh, the it does the mati does mean to uh, is often used in compounds for to know like asi kamati to asi means to reach to alcanzar like you you reach the place right completed something and then mati is to know and I think the glue there you can talk about is is the ka particle there and so you have something similar there with tlaso kamati i'm not sure if it's using tlaso as in the verb form of tlasoa tlasoa or if it's using the noun form of tlasotli uh, but it's it's definitely following the same pattern of asika mati w what do you see there magnus is that you think that's tlasotli or tlasoa yeah i think i think the the kash you say is now it works sort of as a ligature, but it, I think it's really the same thing as the um, as the preterior agentive key for morphine. So it, I would take it from something like tlasoki, something that is loved, or from tlasoa, as you say, the verb tlasoa, and then you get tlasoki. And then when you put a key, key uh, form together with a different uh, verb, you it always becomes ta. Uh, I have an explanation for that, but it is uh, it doesn't really matter. We, you see it, I should say, in Asih Kamati, you see it in in Mohkatsatsi uh, to me to, to scream in fear. Uh, so Mohki is someone who is fearful and Tsatsi screaming, but when you put those together, you get Mohkatsatsi. Um, so you have those, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a grammatical process, right? That, when you glue things together, something yeah. itself has to happen. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that, that you really need to to um, appreciate the grammar a little bit before, before we start uh, interpreting uh, new words or building uh, words out of, of uh, yeah. more Yeah, another one I saw was tlacuache, where people said it means uh, small things that eat fire. <laughs> small thing that eats fire and it's like well yeah this, there's a story about the tlacuachi and it brought fire to the people and its tail got burnt in that process that's a real thing but that doesn't mean that the word breaks up into that it, you'll see it has nothing to do with the word fire no. in there it doesn't fit in there and it doesn't mean eater like fire eater either and so you see this all over the place chihuahua now we add another thing is you have to pay attention to the vowel length right so 
most books I'm not going to modern books. My book didn't even talk about it because it's not really important in modern Nahuatl. There's very few words where it matters. Um, but in older Nahuatl, it, they made sure to often, well, sometimes even they would include letting you know, hey, this is a short vowel, this is a long vowel. And that does make a difference. When you interpret something like the word Nahuatl, does it mean Nahuiat, four waters? That sounds cool. You know, everyone talks about fours, uh, four directions and water because there's water all over the place. It's very easy to lead lead, lead yourself down that path. And people will teach that still. But, you know, the, the truth is sometimes not as, as sexy as that. Um, or or maybe it is, depending on how you perceive it. But Nahuatl is a clear clear sound. And when you look at other languages around... Well- the, the the truth is always <laughs> sexier than the made up stuff, man. I'll always go with the truth over the That's made up not stuff. Good, right? <laughs> I like it. Yeah, well, I should say more like the things that uh, are easier for people to that, that fit in with people's perceived notions, I guess. But a lot of languages will call mm-hmm. themselves. So you, what you were mm-hmm. saying about. Now what meaning clear sound? Yeah, and that's pretty common along a lot of languages, you know. Our language is either related to our state or identity, you know, or our, our language is going to be called what's understood, you know. What I can understand is now what. What I don't understand, mm-hmm. that's mumble, that's popoloka or something else, or some language associated mm-hmm. with them. So what about the word chichimecat? Because that's one word that I see people throw around a lot. Um and I've I've mainly seen it broken down as either um, chichiltik plus mekat, right? So mekat being rope, mm-hmm. so meaning like lineage, and then chichiltik meaning uh, red, so like the red lineage. And then I've seen that expanded upon as like, well, it's the red road, mm-hmm. and they they start trying to associate right. it with like northern natives like stretching following a the red road. Yeah, and then the other breakdown I heard was just from chichit, like dog, mm-hmm. right? Um, and mekat, so like the dog lineage. <laughs> so what? So, so I'll let. And I don't think either of those are true. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let Magnus talk about the mekat. What I want, I'm just going to mention is like you want to look at the patterns of how other people are named, right? Before you just break something down on that without understanding the context, at least there's a language, sure, but there's also the context. Look at how other people are named by the Nahuas. The Masawa, their name is the, the owners of the deer. The Tepewa, the owners of the hills. Okay, so there's a certain constructions you see when you talk, when how the Nahuas refer to other people. Then you have, you know, uh, then you have like the uh, people who come from a certain town names. That's very common, like Zapotecat, person from Zapotlan or Zapotlan. Mixtecat, person from Mixtlan. Um, there's so many names that end in, that have that tekat ending, um, and that's the most common pattern. You know, person from this town or person from this political entity, or you could consider like a tribe that holds the people together. So that's the pattern you're gonna see. Uh, mekat, and then the mekat, uh, Magnus. <laughs> well, so uh, just as you have the you the one you mentioned the, with the where you have a, a place name that ends in clan, and then you have the name of the people who come from there is Tecat, right? So you have uh, Mish Tecat from Mishlan. Well, then you have a very few uh, uh, but important um, place names that end in man. Um, that's another logative ending that is used on place names. And when you come from a place that ends in man, then you're not a Tecat, but you're a Mecat. So, for example, someone who comes from Olman, uh, the place of rubber, is an Olmecat. And if someone who prob- comes from Akolman, which was the place where they had the big dog market up in Tlatelolco, um, is an Akolmecat. Um, so, by that extent, in extending that uh, pattern, then a Chichimecat would be some someone who comes from Chichiman. Uh, and that is not, I believe, a, a place name that's actually attested. But so you'd have to re- back form it or reconstruct it based on that word if you wanted to say that Chichimecat means um, a, a person from Chichiman, which I think is is a plausible explanation. So it would be a person from the dog place or the place where dogs are abound. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> and this is uh, this is the the um, 
the the dog lineage uh, interpretation to me is not completely um, implausible for two reasons. So you do have the word mekat to mean uh, lineage. So tlaka mekat is a is a lineage of people. You talk about all your ancestors going back as a as a as like a rope of people. Um, but then you also do have a myth that's pretty common in some uh, different Mesoamerican peoples, but specifically uh, I've found it to be common in in uh, the west of Mexico among the, the Coras and the Huicholes, uh, 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 which has a story about how after the, the deluge, um, when the world, world had been flooded, the, the world had to be peopled again, and it was peopled by a man and um, a woman who was actually a dog uh, who had taken the shape of a woman. Um, and all people in that, in that, um, in that story um, come from this uh, primordial couple of, of, uh, of a dog, woman, and a man. Uh, so that would sort of lend a certain credence that story to to the idea of, of having a lineage that is is um, part part dog, and I don't think I think we probably when we think about uh, dogs, uh, it sort of has a very pejorative connotation that I don't think it would have had necessarily or probably uh, in olden times in Mesoamerica where the dog was an extremely important. Uh, animal that had uh, a lot of respect around it, really, um, in, in a way that it it, it doesn't have in, in English. So I, I, I about the word chichimeca, I I would not discard either of those uh, interpretations. They can both be, well, one of them can be uh, can be correct. So the the two that you're talking about are uh, people from Chichiman, yeah, and then the dog lineage, yeah, okay. And so there's one word that I love <laughs> because you see it pop up all the time in the Mexicayot, and that is Tiawi, right? And you see this all over the place. It's like um, almost like a vamanos, right? Like, let's go. Let's, you know, adelante, you know, it's it's. Mexica Tiawi or, or Tiawi Mexica is almost like saying Viva la Raza, but, you know, in, in Nahuatl is kind of the way it, it's caught on um, in modern use. But the way that I understand it is, well, at least in the Huasteca, I think that Matiacan would be more in line with saying like, let's go forward or let's go as a, as a people. So in where does Tiawi come from? And, and how should it be used? I'm not sure about the origin of it. You just, you know, it, it's more about how it's used. So the equivalent, the grammatical equivalent to Tiawi in Huasteca would be Tiowi. And you do say that, Tiowi, but um, not as a command, not as like telling people we should do this. It, it literally means we're going or we will go. So that, that's how it would mean we are going, Tiowi, with an H at the end to imply that it's, it's, it means us, not, not you. Um, so if someone uses Tiawi in that sense, I, 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 it would make sense to me grammatically to say it in that sense, like saying like we're going, you know, as a statement, like, you know, we're, we're getting ahead. We're going along. We're, we're going, you know, we're going. So if you know that if you interpret it as that, then then it makes sense to me. But it's not a command. It's not saying let's go. Let's go would be matiakan in most varieties. It'd be something like that. Matiakan. Um, so that's that's how you would use that in, in that sense. Matiaka, let's go. So it just depends how you use it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because that's one of those words that raises a lot of points of contention. Um, because I know that, um, uh, who did they attribute it to? Was it David? Vasquez? Uh, David Vasquez. Um, okay, it may have been. That when he was involved uh, with a poetry group, that there was a strike going on at that time, like a student strike, and that the students wanted like a slogan mm. to rally right. behind, but they wanted the slogan to be in Nahuatl. And so the 
the legend has it, right? I mean, I wasn't there, but that he introduced, you know, uh, Mexica Tiawi as, as, as the way of, not that he invented it. I'm not saying he right. invented it, but I'm <laughs> saying that he introduced it. He popularized it amongst uh, the Chicano community. Yeah, that makes, that, that make, I have heard that as well. Um, but again, since it was just through things I heard, I haven't been able to confirm it, but that's something I heard. And uh, and and we'll say I'll say rest in peace to to the man who who passed away oh, earlier absolutely. this year. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's sad to always lose a teacher. Mm-hmm. And he was a cool dude. I got <laughs> to meet him because of Magnus. Same his, here. Uh, Same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was trying to remember right now if he said anything about at that meeting uh, about whether he had. Uh, Used that phrase in the in the early days of his his work, but I don't remember. I remember him saying it specifically myself no. about it. But it might have not been on his mind because we not everyone was just using it then, that moment. Yeah. Hmm. So Magnus, um, Jan had brought this up earlier with um, chocolate. I I did read your paper where you give a very compelling argument that it should be. Um, Chicolat, right? Chicolat. Well, not that it should be, but that it probably originally was. Okay. Um, but and it's not my argument; it's an argument by Karen Bacon and Cern Wichmann, who are two um, linguists who argued that in a paper uh, about twenty years ago. Um, uh, yeah, I think that is that is the most uh, credible etymology of that word. Uh, because the other one that people tend to give as bitter water, uh, bitter is is shokok. Um, so you could uh, maybe think that shokok at uh, could become uh, or shoko at could become uh, chocol- chocolate chocolate. Mm-hmm. It's often used as as, as a sour, right? There's a difference there yeah. between sour and bitter between chichik and shokok. Just You're right. Sour. Yeah, sour. And um, so it's it's sometimes translated as bitter, but of course because that's how uh, like the chocolate is more bitter than sour. Mm-hmm. So uh, exactly the ar- one of the arguments against this etymology is that it's not it's not a bitter tasting drink or a, a sour tasting drink. It's a bitter tasting drink, so it wouldn't work. It's not chichigat. Um, it's so and and also you have actually a word chocolate, which is a sour uh, uh, drink made of um, what are they called? Um, uh, ciruelas. What are they called? Prunes, plums, plums. Right? They're like plums, right? Sour, sour plums. A type of native fruit to the Americas. Yeah, and you can make a certain uh, water made made out of those and. Um, and and that is sour, but it's nothing to do with chocolate. Um, mm-hmm. So those are the, those are some of the reasons why the the etymology with shoko doesn't work because it's it, that would be sour water, and also because uh, all of the places where the word is documented, it's documented as as Jan says with a ch sound. So it's it's either chocolat or in some places chicol chicolat. Um, mm-hmm. And so what Karen Bacon and uh, Søren Wichmann argue is that the, the, the chicol, ad, the chicol is a sort of a, 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 a stick with a hook on it that you can use for different purposes uh, as a tool. And there's arguing that probably this kind of chicol stick was also used to um, make um, chocolate drinks foamy. So you would call it the chicol drink, the chicol water, what the, the the, when you'd made the chocolate foam with the, with the, the chicol stick, yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the best uh, interpretation of the origin of the word, but what I do know is that it's uh, there are places where it's called chicolat. Um, the only time when we get a ch sound in Nahuatl is when it is uh, in front of an I an E uh, um, originally historically. So um, uh, all, all, almost all chess, chess sounds come from the sound T before an E. So, so T would be to become Ch, G. 
And then what also happens is that uh, when you have a, an I in one syllable and an O in the next, then very often you get the I becoming O. So for example, you also get that in, in uh, grammatically so that, um, uh, what, what's a good example? Uh, so where the T, for example, becomes TO. Um, also you have, for example, if you have a verb that starts with TICON, uh, will do something to something. Tikonitas, um, that can become very, uh, like regularly, tokonitas. So the E is colored by the, the O in the next syllable. So you, you get that a lot, and you especially get that a lot in the Eastern varieties where a uh, uh, short E and short E will become, uh, take on the, the, the sound of the next vowel in the next syllable. So chikolat could become chocolat very very easily, hmm. um, but chocolate uh, with a show that that that's just nothing to suggest that it ever was that. That's probably the most common um, interpretation that I've seen as far as like meme nawat goes. There's a chocolate company now that's selling uh, chocolate with X, X, X right? Um, most of them do. Most most chocolate companies do <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> if they're selling as artisanal. <laughs> Cashing in. Well, so I wanted to run a, a word by both of you, and I'm going to get into some uh, some words that I encountered as an early student of the Mexicayot and get your guys' feedback on some, uh, some Nahuatl. I have this book called Mexicayot, uh, which is attributed to Maria del Carmen uh, Nieva Lopez. It was probably written by Rodolfo Nieva Lopez, but it was published after his death. Uh, he was the founder of the MCRCA, one of the fathers of the Michi the modern Mexicayot movement, and they published this book. And um, it's just full of really bizarre pseudo-historical claims. But one of my favorite pseudo-historical claims is that the ancient Nawaz traveled to Egypt and took culture and teaching to all the people of Egypt in this book, they introduce this word, and uh, I'll read you the quote. It says, uh, Los Egipsi, how do you say Egyptian? Egipsios, Los Egipsios llamaron Atlantes a los Nahuas, porque cuando les preguntaron de dónde llegaban, contestaron con la expresión Atlantique, right? So, que en nuestro idioma quiere decir, vinimos por el Atlántico o sea el mar. So, um, for our other non-Spanish speakers like myself, basically what the saying is that the Egyptians referred to the Nawas as Atlanteans, right? As Atlantes, because when they asked the Nawas where they came from, the Nawas responded in Nahuatl, Atlantique, which is supposed to mean, you know, the, the we came from the place of a lot of water or the, from the place where there's a lot of water. So obviously not true, but where would you even get this word? Like, how do you think they're trying to break down Atlantique? Because I've also seen it as Atlantico, depending on who's writing the story. So it's changed through time. They're trying to add thick, probably. They're probably, tr probably trying to add thick at the end of Atlan, Atlantic, but um, you, you, can't, you can't really do that. You can't put thick at the end of Atlan. A thick basically makes things into an adjective. Atlan <laughs> If you want to stretch it, you could find something like Atlan <laughs> We went to the we water. We went in the water, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could stretch this a million ways. You, as, as much as you can get so, creative, you can make up different ways. But if you're conforming yourself to the, the way that the grammar works, it's it's pretty obvious. It just doesn't make any sense. You, you'll never see thick after a location ending like plan to fuse together into one word it, it just doesn't happen mm -hmm. but it, it, it's definitely one of the words where it where you get like this, this is amazing that it, that it means having to do with water and it sounds like this like and, and of course like when you have so few sounds as you say um there will be these combinations that just reoccur and give you an idea of something oh, it must mean something like this and then you your association start running, right? 
and and that that one is is just very interesting right and there's the, another one that always comes up is the the tail right um uh, so tail which means mm -hmm. deity or whatever how you want to uh, end up translating that word, but it sounds sort of like dios or sort of like uh, Greek theon, right? <laughs> mm. And then you even have like um, theopan, which is uh, a, a, like a, in in uh, now it originally means like at the god place, that like a, a place where you would uh, worship um, theopan, um, which was used for churches uh, primarily. Um, and then that sounds quite a lot like uh, the syllables of pantheon in Greek, just reversed, right? So you get these odd combinations of, of words. And, and the, the, this is the stuff of folk etymology, but, and it's also the stuff of these, these linguistic conspiracy theories where you can, can make up uh, um, stories about ancient travel based on just... Um, uh, the, the likeness of two words. I have a friend. I have a friend. I'm from Den Denmark, um, and I have a friend, and he 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 um, he he's a storyteller, and he loves telling stories about any place in the world that has the syllable Dan D A N in it, and say that those were Danish people who went there long ago, and like like there's a place in South Korea that has Dan in it, and he said he said the Danes went there and they founded this place. And, and he'll make up the data. So, so you can do those things all of the time. And, and it's in a way very satisfying to make up the stories, but not if you, as you say, if you want the, the sexy truth of, of things instead of <laughs> whatever you can make up yourself. Right? Yeah, well, I'm going to throw four words by you guys. All of these I heard in ceremony, by the way. <laughs> When I was uh, active in the Mexicayo, okay. uh, one of the first words uh, was that Citlali means it comes from Se Tlali, the first land, because our ancestors came from the stars, right? And what I like about that one is, is when I bring it up to people, they're like, well, you know, you know, Carl Sagan said we're all stardust and we are in the stars. So technically, and I'm like, yeah, but that's not what they're saying. <laughs> They're, 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 you know, in the ceremony, they were saying specifically our ancestors came from the Pleiades and came down. And that's why, you know, it's called the stars called Sitlali because it comes from Se Tlali, the first land. So well, those are the first words people learn oftentimes when you're learning Nahuatl or exposed to it. You're going to be exposed to words like Tlali, land and Se. And so you're going to see those words everywhere. Everywhere you look, you're going to see those words. But like Magna said, you know. A lot of words in now are made up of smaller pieces. That's very true. But there comes a point in time when you can't break it down anymore. And it looks like you could mm -hmm. if you really forced it, but it would be like <laughs> it, it would be it, it'd be silly even to do it in English, you know? Like we, we don't do that in English. Mm -hmm. No one even tries to, uh, because we know how how ridiculous it can get up to a, a certain a point, you know, like history doesn't really mean you know, story doesn't break down into that, you know, his story, right. <laughs> you know, people do that as a point to say, you know, Hey, history has often been told by, by men. And that's very true. That doesn't mean, you know, a lot of people would say, Oh, obviously no one will believe that, um, that people really there's, believe there's that some people that do though, <laughs> but you get everything in these, <laughs> these days, but it's very easy to do that now when you yeah. don't speak it fluently. And so I, I don't, as far as I can tell, you can't break that word down anymore. That's the smallest. Sitlal and then in is the ending there. Mm -hmm. And now was don't Lali, now was so don't just start. Yeah, now now was don't confuse sitlal with setlal. That's not even a common thing in modern varieties. Nice. So the other the other thing I heard was that Seattle comes from se at uh, one water because it's always raining there. And that the story I, I was told was that, well, the Nawaz obviously went to Seattle and gave it its name. And that's how we get Se'at, the f one water, because it's so wet. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what do you think, Magnus? Uh, it's a no for me, as they say. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, I... Uh, 
I was just uh, just now looking up because I, of course, I don't remember the specifics of the the way that the town of uh, the city of Seattle was was uh, named, but I believe it was named after uh, Chief Sales, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering the the language there. Um, and but but he was a, a chief um, of uh, one of the, the Suquamish. Uh, or the Wamish people, uh, and and it was his name I think that was used to name that town. So so in that way, that would be uh, a weird way of appropriating a, a a place that belongs to the people who we know have lived there for a long time, um, and and it was named in the honor of of one of their leaders uh, uh, by a people who, uh, of course, there are probably now speakers in Seattle now, but. I'm pretty sure that that wasn't uh, when the city was named. Yeah. And and then I just, I'm going to come just going to comment that really quickly and that notice how disrespectful it is both to Nawas and to the native people of that yeah. land when oh, they absolutely when they appropriate right. like that for when you, people are not understanding the culture in which Nawas name places. Obviously, it's, it's not a place. It it it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, just water. Place. It's yeah. not a place, and you 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 would never name a a place like just a a town like like that. that. Never. And so, if if you look into the basics, it just that's in the first chapter of learning how to put town names together. You know, and if you live in Mexico, you see Tlan, mm-hmm. Can, Can, Pan all over the place, cool. and you'll never see just say out. You know. But anyways, that I just want to mention yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other one I heard was that uh, Nacadoches came from Nakat and Tochtli, which just on its face is pretty ridiculous. I don't even want to talk about that one. <laughs> same thing, place name. All the place, all the place names have this. All the place names have the same errors here. They, they they don't at least even offer the place ending name. And then the other one is Michigan, which I heard. Uh, claims that it comes from Michoacan and then Michiwakan, and it's like a place where there's a lot of fish. But I think that's just a, a coincidence in sounds and that it does not have any basis in reality. In fact, I think it comes from like Michigan, Michigan, like the people, that, the indigenous yeah, I think people it's that live there. Something like right? Big Lake or um, something like that like, in, uh, in one of the. Uh, Algonquian languages. Um, uh, I'm not completely sure which one, but it would make a lot more sense for it to be an Algonquian word. Uh, and the meaning big lake is also more, well, I'm sure there's fish there, of course. Um, but that doesn't matter much. You also have to show that there were now speaking people there at the time when the place was named. Um, uh, because yeah, otherwise it, it it just makes more sense to go with whatever the people who actually lived there called it. Are there any uh, other words that that you've noticed, Jan? Like you, just in terms of stuff that sounds alike, or there, there's a whole category of just the wrong meanings, right? So you have words that either are Nahuatl um, and are real Nahuatl names, but they when they get out into memes or circles, they take on a whole new meaning. Okay, so the meme that's very popular oh, yeah. is apapachar. Okay, so, <laughs> All right, so you know, regardless of it, <laughs> yeah. alma, exactly, regardless. Of, so you have the word pachoa and pachoa now, which is usually to squish something, and maybe it was used for massage if you repeatedly squish it, right, papachoa or whatever. But it, there's nothing in the word that means soul, right? There's if you study the now worldview, there's not one word that means soul. It's compartmentalized into different kinds. So there's not one word that means soul. It's not even in that word if you try to say it is. All right. So acariciar con la alma, it's got, it, it is, this is no, it's just giving a massage. <laughs> yeah. Basically, that's it. That's it. Um, aguacat, right? So people will say, oh, that must mean testicle, right? Awakati, because, all right, so maybe there's a town, let's just suppose there's a town where they refer to the male testes as awakas, and that's very possible, right? So Nawas sometimes are very indirect. Uh, yeah, yeah, 
and he there, that there there is that connection being made sometimes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that when people saw the fruit, they named it after the testicles. It's also possible that you know in a lot of these cases that first people saw um, that you you have your own word for testicles, and then to be kind of like when it becomes a taboo word to say it out loud, you look for another way to say it right indirectly, right? In Huasteca, you say no toto, right, meaning my little bird, or no huilo, right, referring to the other kind of bird. Right? There's all these kind of things you could use. Um, and so you could do the same thing with, with private parts. So, you know, saying no waka would just mean saying these are my, you know, my things, but referring to the tree. Not necessarily that people saw a tree and then mm-hmm. call it that. So you can have. Yeah, well, it's like in English calling uh, testicles nuts, right? Right. It's like you don't look at the word nuts and say, oh, did you know that nuts you know, comes from the word for testicles. It's like, no, it's the other way around. It was just a, a word that was used. Exactly. And no one would make that because we it's like slang. We, we know English, so it, it's obvious to us. But because, you know, now it's, it's not as well known to others, it, it's easy to follow that. And, and then there's the most popular one, which which this one, I've seen it not just in Mexican circles, but also in in Mexican or Hispanic or whatever you want to call it, Chicano um, fraternities. Where they have to give each other secret names, there, there some of them are doing it in Nahuatl now, and so uh, I, I see the word Yahuatl be popularized in that in that space is as a, a real Nahuatl word, but everyone wants to use it as only meaning warrior, when the the meaning of Yahuatl is is more generally to enemy, and so you build words upon that to build everything else, right? Yaoyot, right? Enemy ness meaning war, right? And then people who and then from there you have all these different words that you can mean to mean warrior. Like Yautekat, person f- who lives or is from the war place. Yaukiski, the one who went to the war. And there's, there's a bunch of other ones, but uh, there, there's a distinction there. Sometimes you see the, but in all those words, you do see the word Yao, but it's part of the construction of it. Yao by itself wouldn't usually refer to, to a warrior, usually be referred to your enemy. It is attested as a name in in early colonial time, though. So I, I guess I, it would yeah. maybe be a little yeah. bit weird Give it credit to call for your, that. your son uh, enemy. <laughs> so I and then uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that probably that, that that's not too far fetched to also say that it may have like the general meaning of warrior, but it just it's not like it's true. It's not the the, the most usual it's word not- for warrior. It's not the most meaning. Yeah, it's not the most common meaning for it. And there's some varieties in Puebla that still maintain Yalf yeah. as your enemy. You, I've seen that in translations, modern varieties. Um, then again, uh, you know, Magnus has a great list of Nahuatl names that are official, real Nahuatl names located in documents. And just look at the way that Nahuas named each other. Yeah, it's and it's, it's they amazing, do have some, you know? some names that are fairly despective. <laughs> yes. So, so the, there's a there's a guy who was named uh, old, dirty, yellow, old breech clout. You know, the mashlat who's old. Yeah, that was my and... rap name, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> how you know? How would you have that? Um, little fish is the name of little kid. Sometimes. Um, can you even? You know, he has no friends. That was someone's name. He has no friends. You know, he's all alone. But where did he come from? That's awesome. Where did he come from? You know, that's another name that you had. And so we think every name has to yeah. be a powerful warrior. But a lot of names are are silly and, and funny. You got to think about. Well, one of my favorite historical names is uh, Mashishkatsin. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. The, the, wetter, the wetter of himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He who he who pees himself, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I saw one theory that might be something about how they were viewed in their birth. Like if they're in their birth, they somehow had pee. Maybe he was called that or Quitlawa. Maybe he was born with a little bit of excrement on him. And maybe that's why he was named Quitlawa. I'm not really sure about all of those, but but you can have all sorts of names in that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, um, going through my uh, my family tree, I have an ancestor who's... Parents were named Akat and Shochi. And when they were baptized, like pretty general names, right? Well, they're day um, names. They're date names. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're day names. Yeah. yeah. So Shochi and Akat. And then when they were baptized, they were um, given the names like Inez and Jose. And so on the records, he's, na- he's listed as Jose Akat 
and she's Inez Xochitl. And then their daughter, um, who was like my 14th great grandmother or something like that, they gave her the name In- Isabel Xochitl Akat. So they combined uh, like the names uh, of her parents, the original names of her parents as, yeah, as her new last name. So it was uh, Isabel Xochitl Akat. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But they're very, you know, simple names, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not It's not always magical. So one of my, yeah, it, it doesn't always have to be like, you know, when a lot of times when you see people get Nahuatl names, they usually pick them for themselves. And they usually pick the most ostentatious name that they possibly can, right? So they'll name themselves like... Or something. <laughs> when in reality, you, you, you probably would have been named like Akat, you know, something very simple. Yeah, but the true meaning, everybody knows that the true meaning of Akat is reed that flies into the heart of the conqueror. There you go. <laughs> of course. The, the only thing I will say, though, is that uh, historically, you know, the, the Maya lords all had those ostentatious names. You know, it's like, it's not just what's your favorite animal. It was like, it was all of them. Yeah. It was like, you know, uh, spear thrower, owl, jaguar. You know, oh, yeah, throw in three, yeah, na- throw in yeah. three animals. Spear there. thrower, owl. Throw in three names in there that, that are awesome animals. Jaguar, claw of the night. <laughs> they did have the Maya, where the Maya lords, you know, trying to keep themselves in power. They did have these big ostentatious names, but I think they oh, took those. There was they the took one power. warrior. Yeah, the the warrior who was named um, Born into Fire, and he he was the general of the spear thrower owl, right? And he just went down and just carved a path. Yeah, that's through a, uh, through Maya territory. Incredible history. It's not often talked about, but yeah, there's there's a lot in there. Then we so there's there's one word. Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna get to Ishachilan, but. I don't know if you were going to get to that right now. Well, that that was going to be the next word. I, so. <laughs> I was just going to say, I want to end on this one word. Um, so when I got involved in, in the, in the Mission Coyote, I bought this book um, called Juicio a España. I got it right here. And it was written by a guy named Xoconochtlet, who's famous for leading all the protests in Europe for trying to get, um, uh, the feathered headdress of Motexoma returned to Mexico, right? So Shokonoshlet wrote this book, and in it, he talked about, he mentions this word, Ishachilan. And I was like, huh, I've never heard of that word. And he claims that it, that it means uh, that it's the name of the Americas, right? Both north and south, just that the Western Hemisphere in general, the Americas were called Ishachilan. And in my research, I traced it to a man named Juan Luna Cárdenas, who appears to have been the inventor of this word uh, in the, ni- the 1950s or 1960s. He wrote a book called The Prehistory of America. And he actually has a connection to the Pueblo that uh, Magnus's, uh, where you did your research, I believe, in Weapan. Um yeah. Juan, Luna- Juan Luna Cárdenas went down there and... and um, interacted with the people there, but he was the person who invented this word Ishachilan. So I want you to uh, take take it away, Jan. What, what do you think about that word? I'll start with the, you know, all the dictionaries in the beginning had words for, you know, refer to everything, you know, that you have your Samanawak. Um, and those words were written down and they were never hidden or excluded and there was no reason to hide them. So if it, it just didn't exist before for this Karanas person, uh, as far as we can tell, was the first one to use it. I believe they're trying to make it from the word Ishachi and Tlan. And, mm-hmm. and Ishachi meaning like, you know, everything. And like, like the place of everything or something like that. Um, Ishachi being an adverb though. And I don't think you can put Tlan at the end of adverbs. <laughs> Magnus, no, no. can you explain? No, it's true. You, you're like, yeah, yeah. So as you say, the, the, we've talked about the logative endings uh, and the clan, it goes on nouns and the shachi is not a noun. Um, so that's not how you would make a, 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 a toponym in, in Nahuatl. 
Um, so that word just does not work at all. It doesn't. It doesn't work in that sense. But well, I guess it works if people use it and they like to use it. But it's not an, a word I've ever encountered uh, now speakers using uh, in that sense. Um, so even today, is Semanawak used commonly by modern mm -hmm. speakers? Not commonly, but occasionally. I, I hear Tlalpakli uh, um, more mm -hmm. common yeah. like for the entire Earth planet. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe Semanawak more, more like Mex Mexico or like the... Yeah, the yeah, no, the world. It, it is used for the world as well, as well I think. Um, so could it have been used in like, um, I believe the Romans had this view of like the known world. Could it have been used that way? Semanawak, instead of just meaning like a planet or the world as far as, you know, the worldview of the, of the Nawa people using Semanawak to refer to as the known world, just basically what they knew of. I'm just spitballing. Yeah, I think that that would be the logical way of using it. Because why would you include the the part you don't know? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, how would you do that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think yeah, it's it the yeah the the same, which means all or one or united or full, suggests that it that they it has the the meaning of all everything that's around the lake or um, um, anawa is is close to the water right everything that's close to the water and then well what isn't mm -hmm. so, yeah yeah i'm not a prescriptivist either I, I wouldn't tell people what they have to say or what they have to use but for me it's very easy to use semanawa if you wanted to refer to the americas if you had to fit that in and then we have Tlaltipactli, which everyone uses to mean the world, like the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So you have the inclusive Tlaltipactli, and, and you could use Semanawak if you wanted to in a more restrictive sense like that. But at least both mm -hmm. of those are words that have been around for generations and could really uh, really do come from the ancestors. Yeah. And which, and which most Nahuatl speakers, I think, would probably understand, uh, whereas Isha Shitlan, they wouldn't. I'm just not sure how Ishachitlan then became Ishachitlan with an L afterwards, but it might be pronunciation of, of people from back then who didn't speak now. Yeah, I've also seen it as um, Ishachilatlan, um, Ishachitlan, Ishachilan. Um, I've seen a lot of different variations of it, but Ishachilan I know specifically comes from Juan Luna Cardenas in his book. Yeah, I, 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 I would guess that's the original one. And then when you when you have trouble hearing it or don't know how to represent it, sometimes you, you might misspell it then again from there. Ishachi, tla, tlan, or something. Adding the tlan again already when it already has tlan. Mm -hmm. Well, cool, guys. I want to thank you both for joining us on this very special episode of Tales from Astlantis. Episode number 20, the final episode of season one. We're going to take a little break over the next few weeks as we record new episodes, line up new interviews, get more research done, and we'll be back to get in everybody's brains. Um, do you have a, I know you have a website and a YouTube channel, Jan. Would you like to yes. promote Yeah, those? I've got in Spanish, Canal Nahuatl, in the English version, the Nahuatl channel, where I'm posting lessons. Everyone can, you know, they're free, obviously. Everyone can subscribe, watch them, check them out. And Tlahtol Tapasoli, which is an organization I work with where we promote on teaching the Nahuatl language as fluently, you know, not just teaching words, but we try and focus on communication and using it in real life with people. So Tlahtol Tapasoli. And, and, it's, and it's great, by the way. <laughs> All of the classes from your guys is fantastic. I take classes with, uh, with Diego. Ah, can I? And um, that guy's awesome. Yeah. So I recommend anybody who wants to learn Nahuatl to check out your organization and you also have your book, Learn Nahuatl, Language of the Aztecs and Modern Nahuas. Uh, now in its second edition, you could buy that on Amazon mm -hmm. or um, I'm assuming you could have your local bookstores order it yep. as well. This one's not the so, most linguistic so I, book, but it, I wanted to make it as something for the people, for the community, where it's not as linguistically heavy. It's more about exercises and, and getting you to practice the, the patterns of the language, which when I started Nahuatl, yeah. that was totally lacking. So. 
yeah, everyone check that out if, if everyone's anyone interested in learning now, which I hope more people do. Well, I, I highly recommend the book. Um, I am by no means fluent, but I can tell you with using your organization's uh, tools and this book, I, uh, I speak a lot more uh, than I used to, and uh, I feel more comfortable with it. And Magnus, you have a blog. What um, would you care to plug your blog, sir? <laughs> well, it's now it's studies at dot blogspot dot com, um, and it's just uh, my uh, uh, different um, sort of um, reflections about now what that I think might be more interesting uh, for people to read about in blog format than as a as a scientific article going through peer review and all those things. So it's sort of an outlet for for my uh, my ideas that aren't uh, necessarily um, publishable in article format. Well, speaking of published, are you converting your um, your dissertation into a book? Is that something we could look forward to? Yes, yes. Um, I hope uh, very much that within a couple of years, I think I, I'm uh, planning to send it to the press uh, later this month. Um, and then peer review and everything. So it'll probably be a, at least a year or two before it, it, it's anywhere near um, where anyone can read it. But um, yeah, it's in the works. Definitely. Awesome. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining me. And Magnus, I know you're in Denmark, so thank you for doing this. Yeah, I'm you're going back to Denmark. You're, you're, you're well divert, your well-deserved sleep. Uh, thank you, Jan. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.